Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Spark Summit 2017. Brought to you by Databricks. Welcome back to Spark Summit 2017. Uh, you're at, watching theCUBE and we have an honored guest here today. His name is Matei Zaharia and Matei is the creator of Spark, chief technologist and co-founder of Databricks. Did I get all that right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot for having me again. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, Matei, we were watching your keynote this morning and, and real excited to hear about uh, better support for deep learning, mm -hmm. about some of the uh, structured streaming apps now being in production. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask you what happened after the keynote. What kind of mm -hmm. feedback have you heard from people in the hallways? Yeah, definitely. So the feedback has definitely been super positive. I think people really um, like the uh, the direction that uh, you know that we're moving in with Apache Spark and with these new libraries, such as the deep learning pipelines one. So we've gotten a lot of questions about uh, you know the deep learning library. Uh, when will it support more types of data and so on? It's it's really good at uh, at supporting images right now, uh, and also with streaming. I think people are just excited to try out uh, the low latency streaming. Any other priorities people asked you about that maybe you haven't focused on yet? Uh, that I haven't focused on in the keynotes. So I think that's a good question. So I think overall, some of the things we keep seeing are people just wanted to make it easier to um, uh, to just operate Spark or run it and uh, you know run it at scale and and, and not and, and simplify things like monitoring and debugging and so on. So that's a constant theme. Uh, that we're seeing. Uh, and then another thing that's generally been going on, I didn't focus on it this time, is the increasing usage by Python and R users. So there's a lot of work in the latest release to continue um, uh, improving that to make it easier to use in those languages. Okay, well we were watching yeah. the, the demo, the impressive demos this mm -hmm. morning. In fact, yeah, yeah, George was watching the keynote, he saw the mm -hmm. one millisecond latency, and he said, wow. Mm -hmm. cool. George, you want to ask yeah. a little more about that? So yeah, let's, let's talk about that, because you know, there's this, there's this rise of continuous apps, which yep. I think you guys named, yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. resonates with everyone, yeah, to go yeah. along with batch and request response, yeah, um, and in the in the past, so people were saying, well, um, you know, Spark was doing mini or micro batches, yeah, and yeah, mm -hmm. latency was a couple hundred milliseconds, yeah. So now that you're down at one millisecond, um, what does that change in terms of? the class of apps that mm -hmm. you're appropriate for, or you know, um, some people have talked about the criticality of per event processing. Yeah. Where is Spark on that now? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, so the goal of this is exactly to support the full range of uh, you know of latencies possible, all the way down to sub millisecond latency, and and give users the same programming model for them, so they don't have to use a different system or a lower level programming model to, to get that low latency. Um, and so basically, since since we began structured streaming, we moved. Like we, we try to make sure the API is not tied in with micro batching in any way, and so this is the next step to actually eliminate that from the engine and, and be able to execute these computations. And what are the new applications? So I think this will uh, this this really enables uh, two types of things we've seen. One is um, kind of automated decision making systems. So this would be um, something. It could be even on say a, a website or you know say when someone's applying for a loan or something like that could be making decisions but it could even be in a uh, even lower latency like say stock market style of uh, of place or internet of things or like industrial uh, monitoring and, and, and making decisions there uh, that's one thing and then the other thing we see people doing is a lot of kind of stream to stream etl which is you know is a bit more Boring in some way, but as you as you set that up, uh, it, it's nice to have these very low latency um, uh, transformations that can produce new streams from an existing one, because then nothing downstream from them is affected in terms of latency. So yeah. in this last example, it's sort of to help build microservice type applications. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. or, or in general, there's this whole basically this whole architecture of saying, hey, all my um, all my data will be streams, and then I'll have some some applications that just produce a new stream and then later that stuff can go into a data lake or into a real time system or whatever. So it's more mm -hmm. the, it's basically keeping at low latency while it remains in, in, in stream form. Yeah. So we were, we were talking earlier and, and we've been um, talking to the Snappy Data folks and yeah. to the Splice Machine folks mm -hmm. and they, they built 
Spark into a DBMS. Yes, yes. So that like, it's immutable. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's mutable. It's mutable, yeah, mutable data, yeah. <laughs> um, like a data frame is updatable. Yeah, yeah and you can. So, um, what does that make possible? Even if you can do the same things mm -hmm. with Spark without it, yeah. what does it make easier? Yeah, so, so, that's, so that's also in the same uh, spirit of continuous applications. It's saying you should have a single programming model and uh, I interface for doing both your transactional work and your analytics after, and then maybe serving the results of the analytics. So uh, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And um, really, uh, an example of that would be, um, you know, I, I keep going back to say the the financial or like um, uh, credit card type of use cases, but it would be something where you know users are conducting transactions and maybe you learn stuff about them from that. You say, okay, here's where they're located now, here's what they're purchasing, whatever, and then you also once in a while have to make decisions. Uh, for example, am I do do I allow them to go past the limit on their credit card or something like that, or is this a normal use of it or is this a fraudulent one? Um, so that's where it helps to integrate these, and and you can do these things. So so there are um, uh, uh, there are uh, products like Snappy Data that integrate you know a specific database with with Spark, uh, and we're also trying to make sure that in Spark there are APIs so that people can integrate you know their own system, whatever whatever database or key value store they want. So yeah, would you have to jump through hoops if you didn't want to integrate any other store other than? Talking to a file system, or yeah, if you want to do these transactions on a file system, is just there. There will be some, basically, some performance constraints to doing that. It, it depends on the rate. Maybe it, it, it's definitely the simplest thing. If you and if you have a low enough rate of updates, it's, it could actually be fine. Uh, but uh, but if you want more fine grained ones, or if you, th th then it becomes a problem. Is there? The, the, it would seem like if you if you tack on a product for. Ingest, not yeah. that you really want to get you know into mm -hmm. that, but let's say Kafka, which could also stretch you know into the transforms and some mm -hmm. basic yeah. analytics. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, I think, on the Spark East keynote, yeah. like Redis for serving. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. You've got like now a multi sort yeah. of vendor product mm -hmm. stack. Yeah, and so there's some complexity in that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Is there? A, is there? Um, do you foresee you know a scenario where? You could see that as a high volume solution. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that you would take ownership of. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, so, so well, y do you mean from the Apache Spark side or from the Databricks side? Uh, um, actually, so, either. Yeah, so I think from the Spark side, um, basically, we so far the project like doesn't provide storage. It just provides computation and it plugs into different storage engines. Mm -hmm. And so it would be kind of a big shift, it might be possible, but it would be kind of a big shift to say, okay, we'll also provide persistent storage. I think the more likely thing that will happen is better and better integrations with the most widely used, you know, uh, open source storage system. So Redis is one, Apache Kafka, there's a lot of work on integrating that um, uh, better, and so on. Uh, from the Databricks side, that is different because that is a fully managed cloud service, and, and it definitely makes sense there that you'd have a turnkey solution for that. Right now, we actually build that. For people who want that, we, we can build that sometimes with other vendors or with just services built into Amazon, uh, but uh, but that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. okay. And, and Matei, yeah. uh, something I read a press release on, but uh -huh. I didn't hear it in the keynote this yeah, morning. Yeah. I hate to steal thunder from tomorrow, but uh, yeah, okay. can you give us a sneak preview on serverless apps? What's yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, so this is actually, we, we put out a press release today and we'll actually put out, uh, well, we'll have a, a full keynote tomorrow morning. Uh, and also a lo lot more details on our website. So this is um, uh, Databricks Serverless. It's it's basically a serverless platform for running Apache Spark and data science. So mm -hmm. not to steal away too much thunder, but mm -hmm. you know, the serverless computing is this idea of users can just submit a query or a computation. They don't have to configure the hardware at all, and they just get mm -hmm. high performance and they get results. Um, and so far, it's been very successful with stateless workloads such as SQL or uh, Amazon Lambda, which is you know just functions serving a web page or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so this uh, is going to be the the first offering that actually extends that model to data science and and in general to Spark workload. So you can have you know you can have machine learning users, you can have these actually streaming applications, all these things on that kind of environment. 
so yeah, we'll have we'll have a lot more detail on that tomorrow. It, it's something mm -hmm. that we're we're excited about. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, I want to circle back to IoT apps. Mm -hmm. You know, there's um, a, sort of a um, beyond an emerging consensus that we're going to do a lot of training in the cloud because mm -hmm. we have access yeah. to big compute exactly, yeah. and lots of data. data yeah. But then mm -hmm. the issue on the edge is in the, in the near to medium term, the footprint, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of people are telling us high volume devices will have 32 megs of memory I see, yeah. and a gateway server would have like two gigs, mm -hmm. you know, and two cores. Yeah, yeah. So where would, you know, can you carve Spark up into oh, fitting into on one of the- support there, yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. I think for that, it's, um, again, the most likely way that would happen is through um, through data sources. So through, for, for example, there are these projects like um, Apache NiFi and other projects as well that um, that let you build up a, a data pipeline from IoT devices all the way to uh, you know to, to the cloud, and you can imagine pushing some computation through those. Um, so I think yeah, I, I don't have a a very concrete answer. I think it, here it is something that's coming up a bunch, though. So we, we do want to support th this type of like splitting the computation. But in in terms of splitting the computation, yeah, um, you could take a trained model or well, a model yeah, yeah. training is fat you know, fat compute, and then the trained model. You can definitely push the, the model and do inference. Near would the that device. inferencing have to happen in a Spark runtime, or could it be somewhere? I think hmm. it could happen some anywhere else also, and actually like we do see a lot of people wanting to export basically machine learning um, uh, pipelines or models okay. from Spark into another environment. So, so okay. it can happen somewhere else too. Yeah, and then the other aspect of it is also data collection. So if you can push something there that says, hey, here's when the data is exciting, like when the data is interesting, you should remember these and send them on, that would also help. Because otherwise, you know, say it's like a video camera or something, most of the time it's looking at nothing and you don't want to send all that back. That's actually yeah. a key yeah. point, which is some folks, like especially in the IT ops area where, mm -hmm. you know, training wheels for IoT because yeah. they're doing machine learning on you know infrastructure. Yeah, which is there, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. they say, oh, anything outside uh, two, two standard deviations of the ex, you know, uh, band of expectations. Yeah. But there's, there's uh, more of an answer to that, I, I gather, yeah, from I what you're so, saying. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you can create, for example, you can create a, a small machine learning model that decides whether what it's seeing is unusual and sends it back, or you can even make it query specific, like you can count uh, you know, next to, like I, I want to find you know this type of object that's going by the camera and, 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 and try to find that. So I think there's a lot of room to improve that. Okay. Uh, yeah. well, we have just a couple of minutes left here. I want to drill into the future a little bit. Yeah, uh, sure. And there's been a, some great progress since the summit last year to this yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you say is the next boundary that needs to be pushed mm -hmm. to get Spark to the next level, whatever that may be? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Well, okay, so again, on the, so first of all, in, in, in terms of the, the project today, I think the, you know, the big workloads that we are seeing come up all the time are uh, deep learning and stream processing. These are the big emerging ones. I mean, there's still a lot of data warehousing, ETL and so on, that's still there, but these are the new ones. So that's that's what we're focusing on, on, on our team at least. Um, and, uh, and we'll continue building out the stuff that you saw announced today. Um, I think beyond that, I do think that Part of the problem is also, and this is more on the Databricks side, part of the problem is also just uh, making it much easier for uh, teams or, or businesses to begin using these technologies at all. And, and that's where like we think cloud computing or software as a service is the way because it's, you just turn it on and you can immediately start doing things. Um, but that's basically the, the way that I view that is um, right now the barrier to do any project with data science or machine learning or even like simple kind of analytics and unstructured data, the barrier is really high. So companies can only do it on a few projects. You know, there might be like a hundred things they could be trying, but they can only afford to spin up two or three of them. So mm -hmm. if you lower that barrier, there'll be a lot more of them and, uh, and everyone will be able to quickly try one of these applications and see whether it actually works. And so, this yeah. ties into some of your, your graduate 
um, studies, like with yeah. model management and things like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely on, on the research side, so I'm also um, uh, you know, doing research at Stanford, and on that side we have uh, this, this lab uh, called Dawn, which is about usable machine learning. It's exactly these things, like how do you enable an order of magnitude more people to try to do things uh, with machine learning. So actually we're also doing the, uh, you know, the video uh, push down thing I mentioned, that's one thing we're looking at a bunch of other stuff as well. Okay. But, Matei, yeah. we could talk to you all day, <laughs> but we don't have all day. <laughs> We're up against a break here, but I want to thank you very much for coming and sharing a few moments here, and look forward to uh, seeing you in the hallways here at Spark, right? Yeah, thanks again for having me. Thanks for yeah. joining us. And thank you all for watching here. We are at theCUBE at Spark 2017. Thanks for watching. Oh.